Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. A warm welcome on behalf of the Munich Documentation Center for the History of National Socialism. My name is Anke Hofstin. I'm the Deputy Director of the Documentation Center and a member of the curatorial team. I'm very happy to host tonight's online discussion with the title, The Art of Anti-Nazi Propaganda, Willy Münzenberg and the Arbeiter Illustrierte Zeitung. The talk is part of an events program in connection with our current exhibition, John Hartfield, Photography plus Dynamite, Photography plus Dynamite. The exhibition is on show at the Documentation Center right now and up until April 24. It is a collaboration with the Akademie der Künste Berlin, to whom we are very, very grateful for lending us John Hartfield's fantastic photo montages so that we are able to present them to the public here in Munich. Um, but in fact, John, Hartis, uh, John Hartfield uh, as a political artist did not create his works for museums, for galleries or for the art market. His art was created for billboards, for books, brochures, leaflets and magazines. It was political agitation for a broad public. And today's conversation is about the most important medium for which John Hartfield created, it, created his photo montages, the Arbeiter Illustrierte Zeitung or AIZ or AIZ. And it is about his, its founder and publisher, the German communist Willy Münzenberg. Münzenberg is quite a fascinating historical figure and it is astonishing to me that he is so little known today. He was probably the most successful left-wing media entre entrepreneur during the Weimar period. And as such, he is regarded as a key opponent of media mogul Alfred Hugenberg, and of course, of the head of Nazi propaganda, Josef Goebbels. Hartfield and Münzenberg antagonized the Nazis long before their rise to power. They saw through the lies of Adolf Hitler and agitated passionately against him. And in the magazine, um, Arbeiter Illustrierte Zeitung, they found the chance to combine their efforts in a most effective way. The magazine not only rev revolutionized photojournalism and visual culture, it was also a powerful weapon in the fight against fascism. It made Hartfield and Münzenberg two of the most hated opponents of the National Socialist regime. But our two guests are, of course, much more qualified to speak on this subject than I am. So let me give a warm welcome to Andres Zerigon and Kaspar Brasken. Dear Andres, dear Kaspar, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, you are joining us from Spain and from Finland, I understand. It's a great pleasure to have you. Hi. Um, we have agreed that each of you will begin, begin with a brief presentation to lead us into the subject. And following that, you will have a casual conversation, exchanging views and further exploring certain topics that came up. Wherever the conversation leads you, you just told me that you have had many conversations before uh, in the beer garden. So I'm very much looking forward to listening in tonight. Um, but uh, before I hand over to you, I would like to give a short introduction on both of your professional backgrounds and research to those in the audience who might not be familiar with it. So our first guest is Andres Mario Zemigon. He is professor for the history of photography at Rutgers, the State University in New Jersey, United States. He received his education at Harvard University. And from his extensive list of publications, I would like to select only a few examples. First of all, of course, his book, John Hartfield and the Agitated Image, published in 2012. And the book Photography in Germany, published in 2017. Andres Zerigon also co-edited numerous books on photography, most recently Photography and Doubt and Subjective Objective, A Century of Social Photography, both published in 2017. 
his most current and not yet published book project is a history of the Arbeiter Illustrierte Zeitung. We are very much looking forward to that and we kind of get a, uh, uh, some kind of preview to, to your research um, and um, this will be really exciting. Um, but apart from research, teaching and publishing, Andres Zervigon also leads the developing room, an academic working group at Rutgers devoted to photo photography studies. I'm also pleased to introduce historian Kaspar Brasken. He is specialized in the history of international communism and the history of anti-fascism in European, transatlantic and global politics and social movements. Blasken has been visiting researcher at the Freie Universität Berlin, at the Royal Holloway University of London and at the Zentrum für Zeithistorische Forschung in Potsdam. Kaspar works as a university teacher and project researcher at Abo Acad Academy University in Turku, Finland. He is editorial board member of the International Journal 20th Century Communism and since December 2020, the book reviews editor of the journal. In 2015, he published his thesis with the title, The International Workers' Relief, Communism and Transnational, Transnational Solidarity, Willy Münzenberg in Weimar, Germany. Dear Andres, dear Kaspar, uh, I'm very much convinced that you both as experts complement each other ideally in terms of your knowledge and research for tonight's subject. Before I hand over to you, one last note to our viewers. Um, you have the possibility to ask questions uh, to our guests um, via chat, YouTube chat or via email, and we will be happy to take them in, take them in at the end of the discussion. Okay, for now, uh, I'm leaving the screen. Um, I'm very much looking forward to your conversation and speak to you again later. Great, so Anke, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so I ask uh, Jonas, if you could share your screen to um, make available perfect these images. So what I'd like to do is introduce the Arbeiter Illustrierte Zeitung, the AIZ, by talking about its history in the Weimar era um, and preparing the way for a discussion of Munzenberg and the anti-fascist agitation of the AIZ from its exile in Prague in the 1930s, starting from 33. So the um, Arbeiter Illustrierte, the AIZ, was preceded by two titles. So it didn't really get its footing until the AIZ was finally published its first issue, January, 1925. It began in November of 1921 as this magazine, Soviet Russland im Bild. So Soviet Russia, pictorial, Soviet Russia in pictures. And it was meant to be a magazine focusing on the work of the International Workers Relief, which was trying to, it's basically commissioned out of the Soviet Union to try to relieve a famine in the Volga region. And so the magazine covered the relief activities of the International Workers Relief based in Berlin its work in the Volga region. And it also used this platform to promote the new Soviet country, regime, and way of life. So it had these two tasks. Um, if you could forward Jonas. And those tasks were somewhat in conflict with each other, but they nonetheless determined the content of this magazine that preceded the AIZ. On the left, you see footage, photographic, Photographs from the very beginning are always the most important part of the content of this magazine. On the left of starving Russians in the Volga region, the idea being that once you see these people starving, you'll be more inclined to contribute to the workers' aid, the workers' relief, um, and help improve the conditions of these people. But then on the right, you see a different page. These are not facing pages of the new celebrations of the Soviet. Union, uh, at the time it was called Soviet Ru Russia. And so these are people marching on the street, showing their support for the government in various constituencies, women, 
um, or volunteers to uh, the army. This is all represented in photographs and it's pretty straightforwardly propaganda for the new Soviet regime. And then of course, as I say, paired with these atrocity images of starving Russians in the Volga region. So that is what happened for the first year. And then Jonas the next. Then uh, that was followed by another title called Zischer und Hammer, so Sickle and Hammer, which referenced the new flag of the Soviet Union. And that change was because the focus of the International Workers' Relief, its own focus had changed away from the relief of the Volga famine, which was ultimately relieved with international help all around, and more toward both German and other international problems in left politics. Like this issue is covering a worker, a docker strike in Liverpool. This is 1924. So all this was photographically chronicled. It was basically, if you can imagine, a illustrated magazine, but from the point of view of the radical left. And the idea was that it would show you these things that the radical left saw that the press wasn't showing you. It had eyes that could see that no one else in the press could see or allow you to see. So Jonas, the next. Now along the way, something began to happen. And this is you, something you see like represented in this issue of uh, Sickle and Hammer from 1924. One of the things that the uh, magazine did now as Sickle and Hammer was try to retell history. So it wasn't just devoting itself to reporting on the things that the radical left saw that no one else could see a report on, but it was also retelling histories of the recent past, again, from the point of view of the radical left. And it did this in a manner of history telling that they picked up from Marx. And Marx, when he wrote histories like of the 18th Bromère, he took the point of view that evidence was not self-disclosing, that you had to find out what lie behind the evidence that gave it its shape but it took some massaging. And so in this kind of composition, um, so a memory leaf, they're rehashing the recent past in the Weimar era, and they're doing it through a collage of both pictures and headlines called from other magazines, like from the non-left press. And the idea is that it's going to show the recent past by revealing what lies behind the evidence that's been trotted out by other papers. And in the process, it produces this disjunctive composition that itself suggests a kind of chaos of the last number of years. Now, this treatment of photography as a kind of doubtful medium that needed to be massaged and juxtaposed and handled in order to, for it to reveal the truth that lie behind it, that formed the essence of what the AIZ ultimately went on to do. So you want us to the next one? Now here's that first issue of the Arbeiter Illustrierter Zeitung. As you can see, it says Bisher, Sicher und Hammer. So since that point, Sickle and Hammer, and it looks rather standard, um, at least compared to the Sickle and Hammer issues, nothing really pioneering. It's uh, featuring a photo of, well, it's a painting of Lenin made after a photo, widely distributed throughout the, the world by this point. But um, Jonas, the next one. Inside, you could find this kind of composition in the double spread at the middle of the magazine. And so for the first five or so years, the middle page, the kind of central spread featured these photographic um, spectaculars. In this case, it's not trying to massage what lies behind the images because these are all pro-Soviet images taken from the Soviet Union. Instead, it's piling up the enthusiasm that these images provide. Um, it's new relationships, new people. It's showing composition as a kind of new formal approach to photography, representing, expressing the new country and its new people. But you want us the next? This ended up being more typical for its critical approach to photography. Now, not every page featured such spectacular compositions. But this gives you an idea of how the approach of the Sickle and Hammer and now AIZ toward history telling continues in many cases to motivate its approach to photography. So this is on the 
um, 13th anniversary of Hindenburg's involvement, basically in World War I. He's now president of the Republic. And this is an amassing of photographic evidence plus one postage stamp arrayed together in a kind of narrative that starts top left and moves through World War I, the amassing of soldiers, as you see in the middle, hitting the head of Ludendorff, who stands behind Hindenburg, the smaller figure, followed on the right by the Kaiser and now Hindenburg as president. And so what this retelling of history is doing, again, uses the evidence supplied by the mainstream press, the photographs largely, but massages them in such a way in this composition, this photo montage composition, so as to reveal what lies behind the mere appearances to which these photographs were otherwise dedicated. So the AIZ was teaching people how to look critically, both at the press, but also even just at the world around them. And this all comes out of largely their understanding of how Marx told history. Now, there was someone else who was doing this as well around the same time, and that was John Hartfield. Uh, yes, Jonas, perfect. So uh, a number of years before, this is 1924 in the uh, late summer, Hartfield came up with this composition for the show window of the bookstore that um, was the flagship bookstore for the Malik Press. He was the head designer for that press, his brother ran it. It was a, an independent left press, not related directly to the Communist Party. And you can see that he too is retelling history through photographs in the form of photo montage through these juxtapositions, taking relatively familiar images, if not entirely so, and revealing again what lies behind the mere surface of appearances. So Hartfield was working very much along the same lines as those at the AIZ. Um, at the AIZ, this is under the head of Vinnie Munzenberg, the publisher, and the people who worked beneath them. So events another, Jonas. And so you can see there's a real unintended dialogue. Now, Hartfield doesn't start working for the press that publishes the AIZ, the New German Press, until 1927, when he begins contributing to a magazine called The New Russia. And that puts him in the orbit of Munzenberg. And before long, one thing leads to another, and Munzenberg picks him up in 1930 as a contributor. So Jonas, one more. And this is the first contribution of Hartfeld to the Arbeiter Illustrierter Zeitung. It's not exactly a montage. Uh, if you want to know more about this, Sabina Kriebel has written beautifully at length about this composition, which is more or less a mannequin covered in the pages of social democratic papers. But again, the idea is the press will tell you one thing, but the AIZ will teach you what lies behind those mere appearances. Otherwise, you will be blinded as this figure is by, in this case, the pages of the social democratic press. From this point forward, Hartfield contributes regularly to the AIZ until its closure, pretty much until its closure, with a, a one-year hiatus, more or less, when he spends um, about nine months, it could be 12, in the Soviet Union in 1931. So the AAZ becomes the platform for extraordinarily potent anti-Nazi photo montage when these two figures come together, Willy Munzenberg and John Hartfield. And so what I provided is the history of that platform the Arbeiter Illustrierter, and again, its approach to history through photography, historical narration that made possible these montage compositions otherwise associated with the artistic avant-garde. So um, let me hand it off to Kaspar to bring it forward from this point. Thank you very much, Andres, for this brilliant uh, first part of our talk. Um, so let's let's zoom in on, on, on one of the main characters of, of, of tonight, Wilhelm Willy Münzenberg. So I'll give you a kind of brief uh, biographical sketch of, of his life and his, his, his different engagement for international communism and for this international solidarity movement uh, that, that, that he organized. Um, so Münzenberg was born in uh, 1889 
in the small uh, town of Erfurt in, in central Germany. Now, when we remember him today, he's either kind of remember uh, this, this uh, impeccable organizer of this red media empire uh, in Weimar Germany. Uh, <clears throat> And through this work, he's kind of remembered as the more one of the most articulate kind of defenders of both international communism and, and the international left and the Soviet Union. Uh, but the kind of the twist of the story is, of course, that at the end of the 30s, uh, he's the one calling out publicly Stalin as Stalin as, as the traitor. So kind of to emphasize his important position uh, during this time period is that he's he's both characterized as kind of the, the red version of, of, of the conservative German media tycoon, Alfred Hugenberg, or as the main counter-organizer to, to Goebbels and his propaganda uh, work, as Anke already mentioned. So kind of looking back at the political kind of trajectory of, of Münzenberg, his political engagement began in, in 1906. Uh, Babit Gross tells really beautifully about, about uh, Münzenberg's uh, uh, kind of political awakening in the pol political biography that, that she wrote about Münzenberg. Babet, Babet was uh, Münzenberg's uh, kind of life partner uh, throughout this period. And he, he, uh, Münzenberg was from 1906 onwards really dedicated to the Marxist workers' movement, and especially uh, these internationalist projects, right? So this would include the anti-war movements, the anti-imperialist movements, and uh, finally, the anti-fascist and anti-Nazi uh, uh, movements as well. So it was during this time period of, of, of the 1910s that he really became a central figure within the international uh, youth movement. So in 1910, he moved over to Switzerland, to Zurich, uh, and he lived there until 1918. And it was during this crucial time period, of course, that uh, uh, the, the Bolshevik exiles were also residing in, in, in Switzerland. So uh, while there, he joined the Zimmerwald left uh, and he had you know, personal interactions with the leading Bolsheviks, including Lenin, of course. And this is kind of his personal relationship with Lenin is something that he, he constantly refers back to in, in, in many of his later letters and later, later kind of when, when, the, when, the, when he becomes uh, 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 kind of this renegade, he, he always connects back to this. But look at me, I have been you know, in this movement from the very beginning, uh, um, working for international communism. So, but in Switzerland, he becomes the, uh, the leader of this, the Youth International, the secretary of the Youth, youth International. And um, uh, he works uh, for that until he's, he's expelled uh, to Germany in, in November 1918. And it was really here now that, that Münzenberg uh, got, a, got a new role because uh, of course, Germany itself was in, in the midst of a, of a revolution uh, uh, right then. So in Germany, he joins the newly founded communist party, the KPD, and he kind of re-establishes uh, the Youth International uh, in Berlin as well. And Babette really tells uh, nicely also about how kind of uh, already in youth movement, when, when Münzenberg coming from the small town of Erfurt first went to Berlin and he was really thrilled and fascinated to see that everybody were reading newspapers, the newspaper city and kind of the, looking at the influence of the media. And, and this is something that kind of brings back uh, kind of this, the, 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 his role as, 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 a, as a media influencer during this time period. But one of the kind of a central kind of uh, breaking points in Münzenberg's political career was in 1921. Uh, Andreas already mentioned uh, the famine in, in Soviet Russia. So Münzenberg was uh, not re-elected as the secretary of the Youth International. It was previously based in Berlin, but it was relocated to Moscow. And Münzenberg was basically without, without a job within the movement. So uh, Lenin then, According, at least to the legend, Lenin personally asked him to head this famine relief initiative in the West. And Münzenberg established uh, uh, the, uh, the International Workers Famine Relief. And it was truly, really true this initiative that, uh, that became kind of the, the starting points of, of, of this red media empire. Because as Andres beautifully showed, the kind of the first idea was to get 
uh, an illustrated magazine to show, uh, uh, on the one hand, show images of what was going on in Russia, but also to try to raise funds uh, uh, for that for that cause. And during the 20s, uh, this uh, famine relief initiative really developed beautifully into this, this permanent solidarity organization, uh, um, and which re really gave Wittenberg a kind of independent position within, within the communist movement that he, he kind of, he got his mandates directly from Moscow in many ways. So, and he could kind of, he had this interesting interplay between, between on the one hand, uh, the Cape de leadership in, in, in Berlin and, and the Moscow leadership. So, so he, he, he had this talent to, to kind of to play the right strings and, 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 and get his will through, uh, through these different channels. But during the twenties, he really was engaged uh, in a in a in a kind of multitude of different activities going in different directions. Uh, there was this Hands of China campaign in 1925, uh, which really led to the establishment of, of the League Against Imperialism. There was this huge congress in Brussels in February 1927. Um, uh, he was engaged for the celebrations of the 10th anniversary of the Russian October Revolution. So he got the mandate from the Comintern to organize these all kind of and, and plan these celebrations and 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 uh, kind of jubilee uh, uh, arrangement around uh, not only in Germany but the Western world. So he made up the plan, and of course he used the IZ for these purposes. So there's a, some beautiful uh, kind of special issues around the celebrations as well. So um, all these kind of different campaigns and solidarity initiative, initiatives found their kind of visual expression in the eye set uh, as well and its predecessors. So that's, this is kind of the really important kind of uh, role between uh, and relation between the International Arbeiterhilfe on the one hand and, and, and the eye set as a, as a visual product uh, on the other. And one could say that during these years, Münzenberg really got a, a, a spectacular uh, lineup in, of international contacts. On the one hand, he had special relationships uh, to Moscow, of course, to the leading Bolsheviks. Uh, but on the other hand, he formed some crucial connections to uh, left intellectuals, to artists, to uh, authors, uh, kind of other prominent sympathizers of, of, of Soviet Russia and the Soviet Union. And kind of the, the culmination point of that work was the Amsterdam Anti-War Congress in, in 1932. And we could switch now to the next slide. I just, as a, as a new background. Um, uh, so during these years, of course, Münzenberg controlled uh, not only the IZ, of course, but it was the whole kind of media empire that included several journals, uh, illustrated magazines. He had a workers book club, uh, film companies, of course. Um, and also the Arbeitshilfe was, was being organized into sort of a mass movement. They were throwing kind of more, making these local organizations and trying to kind of follow, build up this mass, mass movement around, around the organization. And of course the major uh, publishing house that they uh, founded was the Neue Deutsche Verlag, which Andreas also mentioned. And this is really, when you look at the kind of uh, the historical scholarship, there's lots of written about the Malik Verlag, but not so much on the Neue Deutsche Verlag, which is really fascinating uh, how this, this kind of uh, discrepancy has, has, has evolved. Uh, but of course, uh, he was also involved in the import of Soviet films from, uh, from, uh, from the early 20s as well. Uh, uh, for example, Battleship Potemkin uh, was imported to, to Germany in 1926 and uh, by the by the Asbite. So Jonas, we could switch to the uh, next slide at this point, just to show. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. So I think it's important to remember kind of international the the the, the role of international communists during during this time period. Like we have kind of the radical classic lens glass line. We have kind of a social fascism line, uh, and lots of talk about the communist movement not being that anti-fascist really in this time period. I think the IZ and Münzenberg's engagement really shows uh, that there was um, a serious engagement with anti-Nazism uh, during uh, uh, this time period as well, that usually is covered from 28 to, to let's say 34, 35 until the Popular Front period. So 
these are two examples of kind of how, for example, uh, the IHZ was engaged in, in, in criticizing uh, uh, race biology, kind of the foundations of Nazism. Uh, true uh, humor on the one hand, don't forget to, you know, let your nose being measured by, by, <laughs> by the racial uh, scientists and, and, and true other uh, uh, things kind of uh, trying to show how, how um, uh, kind of the, the racial politics of, of Nazi Germany were, were just trying to distract workers from the fact uh, that it was the class, class solidarity that mattered, mattered not uh, racial questions. Anyways, coming back to Münzenberg, of course, 1933 is kind of a, another, uh, 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 let's say, uh, dividing line in, in his biography. Uh, he's uh, moved to exile. He's, he reorganizes the Arbeiterhilfe uh, from Paris. Uh, the IZ moves to Prague, right? Uh, and kind of telling for Münzenberg's central role as an uh, anti-Nazi character, is that when uh, the Third Reich starts to publish this list of, uh, kind of domestic enemies that are deprived of their German citizenship uh, from August 33 onwards, Münzenberg is on this very first list with 33 names. So with, with uh, Anne Stoller, Kurt Tucholsky, Heinrich Mann and Leon Feuchtwanger, for example. And really from, from Paris, he starts organizing the, the, the major campaign around the Reichstag uh, fire uh, and trial, uh, the Brown Book campaign. Uh, he forms the World Relief Committee against uh, German fascism. He's uh, very much engaged in the World Committee against war and fascism, two kind of central communist initiatives, uh, and really continues this, uh, this anti-Nazi work uh, to, to this time period and really engaged can help the German, uh, German workers uh, to, to form this anti-Nazi resistance, right? And he's a crucial character also in the formation of, of the German Volksfront uh, initiative in the mid uh, 30s. But then towards the end, of course, there was a rift. There was a rift between him uh, and, and, and the Stalinist USSR. So Stalin privately accuses him of being a Trotskyist. Um, and after 1936, Münzenberg doesn't dare come back to, to Moscow, although he's invited several times, uh, but he fears that if he would return, he would he would be arrested and and maybe executed, or or assess on the on a show trial. So as a kind of last effort, there Münzenberg forms this uh, new weekly called Die Zukunft uh, that brings back kind of the last attempt to form an anti-Hitler coalition, and it and it is in this journal that he calls out Stalin that the traitor is you. And in 1940, one year later. Uh, he is interned by French authorities and then dies under uh, still unclear circumstances, uh, right? And Bernhard Bayerlein is currently writing uh, a big monograph about the token, so we look forward uh, to that as well. But that kind of wraps up Münzenberg's uh, role, and there's many threads we could return to during during uh, our talk. And I'll I'll maybe show some more uh, images later later in the uh, in discussions as well of of of. Um, of how how the IZ is is is, is trying to articulate its uh, anti-Nazi uh, message during this time period. So, so so um, given um, Pastor what you presented, I have a question, uh, and it has to do with the anti-Nazi, anti-fascist side of Munzenberg's project. And um, something that you also mentioned, which is the category of social fascism. Because what I've, what I've found interesting about both Hartfield and the Apat Illustrierte, the a 8 is a kind of um, ambivalence about how to form coalitions, especially when it comes to the social Democrats. So the Hartfield first contribution that I showed with the um, figure with the social democratic leaves covering his head so that he's blinded is really an attack against the social Democrats. Uh, who are um, billed as social fascists. So I, I'm wondering to what degree Munzenberg enthusiastically supported that line or ambivalently supported that line, or do you think that he had, through his connections and pulling of strings, a special ability to attack fascism in the IZ and elsewhere through his congresses before 33, when other people 
were told just to toe the social fascist line against the Social Democratic Party. So what, what do you think Munzenberg's unique position is as like being able to be at least anti-fascist when others maybe weren't? Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. I think I think Munzenberg had more leeway kind of, of, of doing doing other stuff than than targeting the, the social fascists. So so there was more room for anti-Nazi uh, uh, propaganda, I would say. So mm. and and I think I the I'd said is a good example of this of kind of on the one hand kind of attacking the social democrats, but on the other hand trying to form a, a sort of coalition uh, uh, on a broader front. Because Münzenberg, he was really proud, but at least when kind of in his letters to Moscow and to the KPD as well, saying that, you know, the communist press, it's only read by communists, you know, but my press, <laughs> that's read by so many, uh, you know, other, other people who never would take a you know, communist newspaper in their hands. So, so he's, he's kind of uh, trying to form, uh, trying to find, finding a space really between that not collaborating or, or you know, stepping over some lines with, with how much you could collaborate with the social democrats, but still kind of a broadening it out to the broader working class. Um, hmm. that, that, that's so interesting because one of the things uh, I found more recently just through um, archives like the Federal Archive and, um, and a few other places, bits and pieces of the Com Communist International Archive that Kaspar you've helped me with, is that it... Well, people have always thought that the Arbeiter Illustrator, the AIZ, was not self-supporting. That um, well, this is actually a more recent strain of thought based on a book published in 2003, that the AIZ was basically heavily subsidized by the workers' international relief by money from Moscow. But what I've found is that actually it made money and um, it didn't make enough to turn a profit, they just plowed that money, it seems, right back into the magazine. And therefore, this extraordinary technology that they had available to them to reproduce photographs through rotogravure, which allowed for much higher fidelity, and this extraordinary kind of graphic ability to make really exciting page layouts, this all costs money. But I wonder if maybe the financial independence that it seems he actually did have, or the new German press had when it came to AIZ, might have also been a factor in applying a kind of independent political line, which I remember Mutzenberg repeatedly asserts in the AIZ as well, that it's nonpartisan, it's überparteilich, which is kind of hard to swallow, but maybe that was how they were able to do it through at least that sort of financial independence in addition to what you're describing. Do you think, does that resonate for you, you think? Uh, well, Let's start with the überparteilich. Uh, I think that's a that's a uh, yeah, it's a brilliant word um, in German uh, because it, there is kind of this idea of, of of being broader than than only only for 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 the communists. But then on the other hand, it, it's it, it doesn't mean exactly that you would maybe collaborate with other parties so much. Uh, it's <laughs> it's more like um, going beyond the communists, maybe maybe in in, in that way. Because anyone reading that, I said, you know, sees that, you know, it's it's heavily pro-Soviet. It's it's uh, you know, it's 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 not disguised in any way. Like there is this, you know, um, this Cold War scholarship going back, like saying, oh, this is uh, you know, uh, kind of some, some kind of hidden fronts for 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 uh, for the Communist International. You just need to flip the pages and see that, you know, this is, uh, <laughs> you know, very very pro-communist and, and so forth. But I think it, the I said was so successful that it gave him this this. Uh, this leeway as uh, uh, really to to uh, to um, to be more more free, and at, as exactly because he he didn't want it to be another communist journal because there were plenty of those, so he could also kind of argue why why it needed to have a kind of different different uh, uh, look. It's extraordinary that that independence, and um, so another thing that occurs to me, um, and and this like. I, I'll ask just this one more question before we start other parts of the discussion, but he's in Paris. The AIZ is publishing out of Prague. He's facing all kinds of other challenges in a French exile. How attentive really was he personally to the I'd said out when it, when it was coming out of Prague? Or was the editorial board really independent of him by that time and doing its own thing? 
So that's a really tough question in many ways because Münzenberg is, you know, he's he, as you know, he's, he's the kind of background organizer uh, in many ways. And then how much, how, you know, engaged is he in the actual kind of editing, you know, work or, or on that. But in, in the lessons I've found, he, he many times kind of comments on, on, you know, was this a good issue or was it a bad, you know, kind of giving, giving feedback on, 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 on how well it went, uh, I think. But uh, I think you could tell us more about, you know, he was really concerned about, you know, the print quality and, you know, uh, how good how good the standard it was the, the publication and and so forth. I, I mean, that's really fascinating. It kind of shows his engagement with with the magazine. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'll add so for the the documents that I've seen in um, the early 1920s. So when he's working through uh, Soviet Russian pictures and Sickle and Hammer, he is obsessed with the print quality. Uh, this is when they're publishing in half tone at mostly the press that's set up, like the actual machines that are set up for the Communist Party press, which focused on text, not images. And so the images were coming out looking really, really bad. And he writes these ragingly angry messages, uh, postcards and short letters to the Politburo of the German Communist Party, addressing like leaders of the Politburo in really harsh terms, saying that they're basically trying to sabotage his, his publication projects by making the quality so low. So from the very beginning, yes, he's really uh, super concerned personally, directly with the print quality. Leading uh, in October of 1925 to the switch to Rotogravur. And I need to emphasize that's expensive. It was one of the very few magazines publishing in this expensive uh, and beautiful technology. And yet it was this, um, you know, a uh, magazine associated with the radical left, if not directly a product of the German Communist Party. It was, it was not that. Um, so I want to emphasize, yes, at least in those moments, he was very directly involved. And he's, uh, here's another thing, Kasper, I always find such a kind of entertaining thing. He's constantly plugging the circulation numbers forever. It's always in his, like, like you're saying, he, he's like, you know, this is something that's actually read by people. And I can't be certain that those figures are correct. Um, it turns out that for most journal, most magazines and publications, circulation numbers were more or less a trade secret. But um, if it's if he's correct, then it was the second wide, most widely circulated magazine in the Weimar era, second only to the Berlin Illustrated magazine, the Berlin Illustrated Zeitung, which was a mass magazine. So I've, I'll throw that in. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really, I mean, and connecting back to Mintenberg's kind of idea of, of you know, the image working in, in, in how, how, how is that communicate, communicating kind of the, the, the political message or, 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 or the, the campaign or, or, or whatever is, is, is going on. And, and you know, this, this very important kind of article where, where he shortly describes how, how he's, he's concerned that in, in communist publications, without any illustrations, without any pictures, uh, you would never know, will they read this? Will they, you know, will, will this be communicated to, to the working class, you know? But he says, if there is an image, if there is this, this illustration, we can directly communicate with the masses, right? So he's really kind of enthusiastic about it. Uh, that's, that's really fascinating that he, he sees such power in these images and maybe naively so kind of also, I'm not sure if it's always a kind of a, a successful communication of what they're, you know, it's always uh, under interpretation, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, that for, forever the case, but but that is a demonstration of the degree to which he was a fairly sophisticated media, uh, media, what would I say? Like nowadays you might say he was unintentionally a media theorist, given that his relationship to photography was so, I think, quite sophisticated in that article, I believe that you're referencing Kaspar was published in the Worker Photographer. And the Worker Photographer was a parallel publication to the AIZ. The idea being, again, this is Munzenberg's brilliance when it comes to propaganda agitation used so nicely as well in the 30s, that they, the AIZ could not rely like other mass market illustrative magazines on picture agencies which produced a kind of uniform output 
that didn't necessarily meet the needs of the left, the, the, the world from the left point of view that the AIZ was trying to report. And so they, um, Munzenberg is super invested in starting this movement, the worker photographer, whereby amateur people who identified as workers or communists, or it was pretty open, would contribute photographic material ultimately for, the publica for publication in the AIZ. So making for a truly different view of the world from people who are actually living this worker's life in his mind. And also it would um, be a way to teach people reading the magazine how to look with this worker's eye as he and, and his colleagues call it. This is extraordinary sophistication. Now in the end, let me just add, and so Casper, I'm wondering what you think about this. I, I feel like on the whole, the worker photography movement as a supplier of images today is he failed. So there were plenty of features that included those pictures. And a lot of them were of anti-fascist demonstrations. Like this, the body of the AI, worker photographer images that were contributed to the AIZ and published there. But I think on the whole, they didn't quite work with the AIZ's model because the AIZ's model was founded on overturning the meaning of often seen photographs, the photos that had already been seen or that were one way or another shaping public opinion in the other presses, the other organs. And once they had gotten into that habit, taking on more positive photographs that would not be tempered with, but that would be praised was too much of a challenge for most of the run of the AIZ until it gets to Prague. But do, do, do you see something different when you see the expressions of the worker photography movement in the AIZ and elsewhere? No, I, I would agree with that in, in a sense, because they were, of course, trying to say to the to workers doing these photos that, uh, you know, we, we don't want these, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, people standing and, and posing for the camera, but we want these photos of, you know, action of, you know, of, of these fights or demonstrations and, and, and you know, uh, pictures that would, you know, move you. And, and that was, that's difficult to get, you know, so, so. Uh, and then, of course, the equipment. I mean, getting good cameras to uh, uh, to, to be able to take that kind of photos. It's it's not uh, that was no easy easy thing. But Christian Joschke has written this beautiful book about this recently, so I, we can recommend that. Uh, yeah, uh, as well. It, but I I could uh, return to some of the uh, if we may uh, to some of the illustrations. Please, please, because you have a number of really great anti-fascist um, covers. Yeah. So if uh, Yes, wonderful. So yes, all right. So on the one hand, we had yeah we had the examples on, on, on racial biology, but on the other hand, uh, uh, I argue elsewhere that that the I said was really engaged kind of in reinterpreting and and kind of uh, shaping the image of the of the swastika as well in in many ways. Kind of you know Germany, the new Third Reich was of course building up the swastika as the new national symbol as you know. Uh, the the symbol of, of national pride and so forth, and this was a really kind of easy target for uh, for Hartfield as well to kind of use visually uh, in 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 different ways how to kind of, kind of either smash the swastika or show that you know it's actually you know capitalism disguised uh, trying to kind of uh, uh, like in in this one uh, this this sign uh, is 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 going to you know betray you and 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 you know, sell you to the to the capitalists. So, kind of trying to argue that, uh, trying to, I would say, especially trying to reach outside to the working class, those working class radicals who may be kind of, you know, leaning either towards Nazi influences or 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 or, or towards other solutions. Kind of will to at least neutralize those who might be interested of Nazis and trying to show what 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 is you know the the truth about nazis again kind of telling the truth about the nazis which they themselves of course uh uh, uh would keep hidden keep them their masks on uh and we could take the next slide as well uh at this point and this is kind of again uh showing kind of uh one of the anti-nazi solutions uh is of course different kind of illustrations of international solidarity of these you uh, these actions of of unity of you know pulling down the nazi flag flag uh, uh trying to boycott the nazi flag for example and and really uh uh you know uh, 
putting blood on blood on the on, on the swastika and showing that you know this is this is what what Nazis and the Third Reich will uh, really lead to, and this is something I see constantly in in these anti-Nazi uh, propaganda uh, um, images is that. Uh, uh, kind of this constant effort to try to show, to tell the truth about what Nazism really is, uh, which is really striking, I think, uh, looking at it, at it uh, uh, from today uh, uh, in many ways. Yeah, um, the, uh, the echoes are rather uncanny. But you, do, do you have another set? Uh, there's one more set, yeah. Hmm. And of course, uh, I think the I'd said and Hartfield were really kind of, uh, you know, they were, they were um, Giving this different uh, face to uh, to Nazi leaders as well, like like Göring uh, and kind of shaping the public image of the Reichstag uh, fire trial, for example, uh, throughout. Not maybe so much in Germany because the spread of the IZ in in Nazi Germany must have been limited. I think so. Uh, I think this is a shift also for the anti-Nazi work is that it's it's uh, you know directed to the to the exile to the to the kind of German communities around around Germany and not trying, yeah, they were sometimes successful in smuggling in issues, I think. Uh, I think you have mentioned sometimes about, about those different efforts to get it, get the ITED into to the readers in Germany as well. But this was, uh, you know, an uphill battle uh, uh, during these years. So, but still, uh, these kind of um, illustrations, again, portraying the swastika, uh, with you know the dead worker or you know trying to to illustrate again what are the consequences of, of nazism and trying to kind of uh piece by piece uh you know kind of deconstructing uh the the, the myths of, of nazism really through these kind of visual means as well so again kind of uh repeating that what we said earlier that it's not only about about the written text and the written uh, kind of anti-fascist messages, but about these uh, kind of visual visualizations of, of this uh, anti-Nazi message. Yes, and I, I, I'm thinking of something about uh, Harpel's approach to this in addition to what you've said. Let me just note, the uh, AIZ claimed that it tried to smuggle in miniaturized versions of the issues into Germany. Um, it seems to have met with little success and they even claimed they airdropped issues into the country, but um, this is all rather suspect. As you say, it was clearly intended for German speakers around Germany and in exile uh, further away. But um, regarding Harfield's ability to marshal the symbols of the Nazis against them, uh, specifically the swastika, it's important to note that he was trained as an advertiser, that he was not trained as a fine artist, but as an applied artist in advertising. And he knew very, very well how to encapsulate an idea, a product, a feeling in a symbol. And so he specifically worried about the power of the swastika as that symbol that expressed um, various aspects of, of national socialism. So in fact, he in 1926 made an effort to forge a communist, German communist symbol that would be just as um, widely disseminated and, and uh, what would like persuasive as the swastika proved to be, and that was the raised hand. Uh, Sherwin Simmons has written beautifully about Hartfield, specifically looking into trademark histories to see what would most successfully be a kind of visual trademark for the German communists, and and this was a hand uh, like this raised with open fingers. It's like the open fist. You see the palm. And it was a photograph of a worker's hand uh, selected from, uh, as it was reported, hundreds to be that symbol of German communism. And the idea was, it was an expression of worker, in this case, super masculine force and power and, and resistance, as well as referencing the working hand to begin with. So Harfield's ability to dismantle, he hoped the propaganda of the fascists was not just in overturning their photographic symbols like forever the face of, Hit of Hitler, you see again and again repeated in the anti-Nazi covers and inside sheets and the AIZ, but also their symbols and specifically the swastika. Again, I emphasize because he himself was trained as an advertiser and knew its power, but also how to dismantle it and contest it, at least 
he hoped. That's the result of what, what got out of these montages. But, um, so I, I know we're, we're fo focusing on this um, problem of uh, anti-Nazi uh, propaganda because this is the uh, National Socialist Document Documentation Center. Um, but I do want to just underscore a little bit in addition that is not only what Hartfield did. He, his photo montages for the AIZ pursued other themes and other politics um, like support for the left in China, or um, it, it could be pretty much any theme that was being picked up in any one issue of the AIZ. Hartfield would make a, a photo montage that more or less distilled the problems of that issue into one image. Uh, and increasingly it became anti-fascism. And of course, anti, it wasn't only about anti-Nazism. It was, you know, during the 30s, uh, mm. it was about, you know, the fight against international fascism. So, you know, was it in Austria or, you know, Spain or, or wherever, uh, it was, you know, international struggle. So it's, I think this is really, and Hartfield has some, some beautiful illustrations of this as well, kind of the, the, the fight towards, against international fascism and not only yeah. specifically kind of Nazism, uh, uh, yeah, that's really important to underscore. One of his most famous uh, photo montages, originally for the German Communist Press, was called The Face of Fascism, and it was a montage of Mussolini's face with a skull, like merging the two. And it was quite a menacing image, and it featured also uh, images of other fascist leaders um, from here in Spain and, and elsewhere. Um, so yes, he was an international anti-fascist, <laughs> like Munzenberg. So they really were beautifully aligned. Yeah, yeah. I guess the only difference is, is kind of due to Münzenberg's being, you know, the traitor and renegade. He was, you know, of course, in, in the East German scholarship and so forth, uh, you know, he, he was not remembered. He was not, you know, uh, brought back really until, you know, after the fall of, 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 of communism. So yeah. that really and kind of emphasizes why, why he hasn't been that much uh, researched or, or written about. Uh, uh, during, during uh, you know, the previous years is, is you know, uh, the archives were, of course, closed. Uh, they were either in Berlin or Moscow uh, and they were and the subject of Münzenberg or the Arbeiterhilfe were not really that, you know, um, interesting uh, to, to look at this activities of, of you know, this, this, this traitor. So, uh, so this is kind of important to, to keep in mind as well why, why we need to return to Münzenberg and the uh, Eidzett and, and Hartfield uh, uh, now again. Yeah, because of these otherwise lost histories, especially at a moment when they seem, as Harper would say, actual vini, I think, like more, re more relevant, more topical than ever before. The, and let me, before we hit the hour, let me just mention one more thing. Uh, Munzenberg's fate could have been Hartfield's too, because when he got back to what then was the German Democratic Republic, this is in 19, October 1950, I believe is when he returned, he, was, he remained in exile in London because when it was um, Soviet-occupied uh, Eastern Germany, the authorities wouldn't let him back in. He was seen as a, a renegade, an avant-garde artist. He couldn't be controlled. So when he got back, they immediately started preparing him for a show trial. And the protocol from the interviews with the Kadaschaft, with the people in charge of like emphasizing or you know discipline, um, are really horrifying because they're clearly trying to hook him to people like Noel Field and others who were associated with, like, like Munzenberg, um, the traitors against international communism. And um, he was more or less saved by people like Beto Pech, but he, he had his first heart attack in that period. Um, it was clearly a great deal of stress. And, and had he been subjected to a show trial or simply disappeared, he might have been partly forgotten like uh, Munzenberg. So there is another uncomfortable parallel between the two of them. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point as well. Uh, oh. And I think uh, maybe, I think we have, we have out of time. Uh, uh, yeah. According to, to Anke, we could have, yes, uh, maybe some questions or... or uh... Yeah, thank you very much for um, bringing me back in. Thank you so much for, yeah, this really fascinating insight into your research. And I understand that we really touch many, many, many subjects and it's really a very wide field um, um, that 
the IZ is leading us on to if we look a bit closer. And um, I think it's really, really important to explore the historic context in which Hartfield's works um, were developed, uh, were published to be able to really judge and fully appreciate their impact and their importance um, not just then, but also today. And as you, the, the, the few examples, because there were more than 300, I think, photo montages Hartfield, Hartfield created for the IZ. Uh, 260, 260 for the IZ, yeah. yeah. Um, so just those few examples showed how um, certain strong images and symbols have um, uh, are being used up, in, up until today, like the smosh, uh, sw uh, um, smashed swastika, for example, yeah, which is still a symbol, a symbol, symbol of Antifa, and also the raised fist, yeah, um, that we have seen. Mm. What I would like to maybe explore a little bit more is the question of the actual readership um, of the Arbeiter Illustrated Zeitung. Of course, we've learned it was addressing workers, yeah. Um, but um, I think because it's quite, Hartfield's montages are on a quite high intellectual level to be understand. Of course, they are strong, uh, they have a strong visual power, yeah. Um, but um, I think it's my opinion that we can also see in the set the aim to address maybe the middle class. Uh, the, the bourgeoisie to, to, um, to sort of convince them that maybe the Soviet Union is not as dangerous as they are being told by other media, um, main, the mainstream media during the Weimar Republic. So let me ask you, what do we know about the actual readership? Um, what are your thoughts on, the, on, on that? Um, I, I can note uh, in 1926, in the summer of 1926, Munzenberg um, helped write a report on the sales of the AIZ. This is in the uh, Federal Archive in Berlin. And in it, he worries that not enough workers are buying it, at least as far as they can tell, that it's instead more or less urban, lower middle class and middle class uh, people who are the readership. Um, it seems like later he works with that to his advantage, but at that time, he, uh, when he's being pretty honest about who's reading it, he's not initially like so happy about it. But Caspar, what what is what is it that you've seen among the readership or potential readership? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, um, what they usually uh, we of course we have the print numbers and there's lots of discussion about how you know if they're correct or not. But he he was you know talking about you know maybe half a million per issue towards the 30s uh, early 30s. Um, uh, and then, of course, emphasizing, you know, it's not only read by one people, you, one person, it's, you know, you know, you pass it along. And uh, so you, you should multiply that by several uh, kind of uh, so it's a you know, huge, huge, huge uh, amount of people who would read it. But then if it's working class, class, if it's middle class, it's really difficult to say. I think they were aiming at, you know, uh, you know, exactly the group who, who, who wouldn't read the communist press, but he who would kind of uh, enjoy reading something like this. So so. And I think that would absolutely include kind of middle class, lower, mid, lower, lower middle class or, or so forth, uh, and other kind of sympathizers, uh, respective of really class, I, I would say, you know, kind of um, intellectuals and, uh, and so forth. So, and so yeah. yeah I, think you, I think that makes total sense, Caspar. Let me just add that it would also possibly include people who were simply attracted to the visual book, of the magazine, because it was unlike anything else being published on the mass market at that time. And just as an example of how this could be a broader appeal, uh, one of Hartfield's compositions, which was, um, I don't think we saw it, it was uh, Edok, the Übermann schluckt Gold und redet Blech, like Edok, the yeah. Superman the Übermann. swallows, yeah, swallows 10 and uh, swallows gold spots 10. Um, that was so compelling for Count Harry Kessler that he financed the reproduction of that image so that it could be put on um, columns, advertising columns around the country. So there's just like that readership of the AIZ, but then there's these other facets of what would ultimately be a kind of an extended readership that one can consider as well. 
So is there um, sort of a shift um, on, from the time before 1933 and after 1933 in um, connection with the form Hartfield's montages were embedded in, in the magazine? Sometimes he had the title image, sometimes he was inside uh, um, or I think even on the back side. Of, of the magazine, is that correct? So yeah. can you uh, tell us if you can maybe um, find a shift in the frequency um, that the Hartfield montages were integrated or maybe the, even the tone and the subjects uh, the montages were, were um, addressing? Well, the, the, up until, the, um, until March of 33, It, there's no real good continuity. Uh, it could be the cover, it could be interiors. Uh, I don't think he started doing the backs until he was in Prague. But um, what I find remarkable is that it's really difficult to find a pattern until he gets to Prague. And so the, the best person to ask about the Prague period and if there are patterns would be Zabina Kribo, who was here uh, at the last, because she has taken a better account of what kind of patterns one finds in especially his approach to humor from his perch in Prague. There, I believe she can talk about some continuities and themes and placement. But until that point, it's rather um, predictable. Uh, my sense is that they designed each issue on the fly. They had one week and they did it as quickly as possible at a really cut rate price because obviously all the money was going to the Rodegrave Board Presses and with a really reduced staff. Oh, uh, so that, yeah, that's how I would answer that. Yeah, and it was a sometimes a reaction to current political events. So they really had to make something up. To, to, well, to that, and Zabina Kribel has also pointed out that sometimes it, it was a reaction to something that actually did not happen. It was an invented story. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are some of his best montages. So it, it, I'm talking about it in the 30s from Prague. And another thing that I, um, I, I learned about is that the IZ sort of um, got into conversation with their readers, with its readers. They tried to activate them, to integrate them, to, to have them participate. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that? Because I think this is quite a fascinating aspect, um, which sort of is, yeah, uh, We, we, we can see this in today's memes, yeah, that montages are a medium which is um, easily to learn. Um, of course, Hartfield's montages were quite an art form, yeah, um, the way he produced them. And you said uh, that he was obsessed with quality as well. Um, but at the same time, working with photography and combining photographs is something that everybody can do with little means as well. Well, but it, so wait, Kasper, I want you to talk about some of these things too, but let me just emphasize in, the, in Berlin, like in Germany before 33, uh, because of a, a kind of sense among German communism, or at least the Communist Party upper um, hierarchy, uh, that photo montage was really uh, an avant-garde affair and something that should not be done by communists. Um, it's, it's like Hartfield got a pass, but no one else was allowed to do it. And in the work of photography magazine, a work of photographer, people who were being taught how to make photographs suitable for the designation worker photograph were also advised, don't make photomontage, you'll be a dilettante, until the very end. In the last year, uh, in, in 32, suddenly then they were advised, okay, you can do this. You can make photomontages, it's your participation in dismantling mainstream visual culture or fascist visual culture. And then Harfield actually composed articles for the AIZ in the later 30s, where he actually encourages people to do this. He um, gives instructions on how to use paste, how to process photos, et cetera. These are really great contributions that run like week to week. And, um, and he was coming from the point of view ultimately of this guy, Sergei Chechakov, with whom he spent nearly a year in Russia who actually wanted this to be the case for photomontage, that anyone would be able to do it and contribute to the dismantling of popular visual culture or building up a new one. Yeah, I, just picking up one of one of your points was, was kind of how the communist 
party leadership was really kind of didn't always understand the point of of the IZ or or the point of the Internationale Arbeithilfe or, or whatever Münzenbergers would, was doing, because they were thinking, you know, these resources, these energies should be, you know, focused on the Communist Party. Why shouldn't the Communist Party had it have its own kind of illustrated magazine that the workers would read? Why why give over this this powerful medium to Münzenberg and his circle? So there was always a constant constant struggle also, and really the Communist hardliners not understanding. What was the point with this uh, with this magazine, which is striking, of course, today? Like this was one of the most powerful, you know, magazines uh, for the workers' movement during this time period. Uh, but on the whole, they were wedded to text. They just didn't understand images. The great majority of these people in the party. That's how I would at least interpret this problem. Yeah. yeah. And after all, you've mentioned it um, with other words, but it was a populist medium. Yeah, the IZ had a populist uh, approach to delivering their message. Um, and I find it, um, I find it very good, um, Andres, um, how you kind of address the fact that um, Hartfield on the one hand and Münzenberg, of course, as well, um, were fighters for the truth. Yeah, they don't, didn't want to, they wanted to, ex you know, to expose the lies of, of the uh, Nazi party or capitalists, but at the same time, they were kind of um, using the means of propaganda as well. And they did it really elaborately. And um, I was wondering maybe, um, yeah, how do you, from today's perspective, how do you um, feel about that, about this populist uh, um, approach um, to left-wing um, um, polit political communication, can we learn from Münzenberg or is it something where you would say there's a certain danger in it? What do you, what do you think, Casper, in terms of like <laughs> the forums now where people are pursuing agitation of various sorts? Of course, there is a danger if we now only pick out kind of the, 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 the lines of arguments that we kind of enjoy or like uh, or, or align to. Uh, so so there are other sides, of course, of, of this magazine, kind of the very, you know, they were not telling the truth about the Soviet Union, uh, of course, but they were, you know, painting up this very glossy image of, of the workers' paradise. And this was, of course, but it was a part of the kind of the contrast about between, you know, uh, capitalist society on the one hand and, you know, the arising, uh, you know, workers' paradise in, in the Soviet Union on the other. But of course, this needs to be, you know, very, very critically read. And, you know, what what was their, you know, uh, message? But of course, it's difficult to say. Of course, what were readers picking up? You know, what were their, you know, what was? But I I, I think um, the kind of uh, you would find, you know, images of of Stalin and celebrating Stalin as well, and and you know these, uh, you know, the uh, dictatorship dictator, dictatorship over there. So so it's. Um, it's a hard, hard line to, to draw, I would say. Yeah, the, I see your point. Even then, there was a great deal of ambivalence in this kind of um, agitation and propaganda, just as we find today. And plus, I, I would also emphasize, so uh, Janos Reismann, who was a worker photographer who in um, Germany helped Hartfield make his photo montages, like Hartfield could not always find the photo he needed. So this uh, worker photographer would help him is um, in Berlin and later Prague, I believe it was both. And, and he wrote an article after the war saying, um, yeah, anyone can be a photo montage artist, but no one can be a photo montage artist like Hartfield. He emphasized that, that his work was different. It was painstakingly produced. It was incredibly smart. And the kind of slapdash stuff that you might find um, like on Snapchat, maybe, it's unfair to compare it to someone like Hartfield, but even the comparison across the pages of the AIZ from one kind of photo montage composition to Hartfield also might be unfair because again, Hartfield was uniquely like talented at this. So I think even like we should account for the ambivalence at that time, much as there is today in terms of how propaganda cuts both ways or in bad ways really. And, but also the distinction of Hartfield over others. Um, the AIZ had a variety of, of work in it. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Andres. I think this is uh, the perfect statement maybe to, to close the evening. Um, thank you so much for um, participating in our program. Um, before I say goodbye to you both, I would like to uh, inform our viewers about our next online event. Um, it will be a presentation at the Documentation Center, not on Zoom, um, with Anna Schultz and Maike Herdes uh, of the Akademie der Künste in Berlin. And they will be talking about the um, digitaliz digitalization of Hartfield's estate um, and its presentation to the public, which was accomplished by the Akademie der Künste. And I guess it's probably for you, Andres, a, a great tool to, to, to do your research. Fundamental. Uh, yeah. So, and they will be talking about um, um, their work and give insight into, into this very challenging project and, um, and present this. And it will be interesting for um, specialists working in the museum field, um, in education, in online services and so on. For details, um, please check out our website. Um, also for details on the following events, the exhibition, um, will be on show on, up until April 24. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, we invite you to, to visit us. Um, we are open every, every day except Monday and the entrance is free. So thanks everyone for watching and especially um, thank you Kasper and Andres for joining us tonight. Um, it's been a great pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thanks so much for, for a great talk. Yeah, it was fun.